Oh, great. Uh, John Preskill, professor at, at Caltech, um, uh, an expert in uh, uh, quantum information science and quantum computing. Uh, he's going to uh, tell us about how to learn in a, in a quantum fashion uh, uh, for, uh, with machine learning. Thank you. Uh, thank you, David. I'm excited to be here. I'm a theoretical physicist, and my background is in particle physics and cosmology. But for a few decades, my main research area has been quantum information science. But I don't feel that what I'm doing now is so different from what I worked on in the past. In my view, Quantum information science is the early stage of the exploration of a new frontier of the physical sciences. It's different from the short distance frontier we explore in particle physics or the long distance frontier of cosmology. But like those, it's very fundamental and exciting. We are now acquiring and perfecting the ability to prepare and precisely control very complex quantum states, states of many particles which are highly entangled, which are so complex that we can't simulate them accurately with our most powerful existing conventional computers or understand their behavior very well with existing theoretical tools. And that opens new opportunities for discovery. So I want to say something about how AI can be leveraged for the exploration of that frontier. But first, I want to give sort of a quick overview of quantum computing, its prospects, and its status. Our conviction that this will be an exciting frontier to explore rests largely on two ideas. Quantum complexity, which is our reason for thinking that quantum computing will be powerful, and quantum error correction, which is our reason for believing that quantum computing can be scaled up to large systems that could solve problems that would be too hard to solve otherwise. And both of those ideas rest on the underlying concept of quantum entanglement. That's the word we use for the characteristic correlations among parts of a quantum system, which are different from correlations that we normally think about. You can think about it this way. Imagine a book which is 100 pages long. And if it's a conventional book, written in bits. Every time you read one of those pages, you learn 1% of the content of the book. And after you've read all the pages one by one, you know everything that's in the book. But suppose instead it's a quantum book. It's written in qubits, the quantum analog of bits. And the pages are very highly entangled with one another. Then when you look at a single page, you see just random gibberish, which provides very little information to distinguish one highly entangled book from another. And after you've read all 100 pages one by one, you still know almost nothing about the information content of the book. Because in the quantum book, the information isn't encoded in the individual pages. It's encoded almost entirely in the correlations among the pages. And if you want to read the book, you need to make a collective observation on many pages at once. So that's quantum entanglement. It's very different from notions of correlation that we encounter in ordinary experience. And what's particularly interesting is that these quantum correlations are very extravagant, very hard to capture in terms of ordinary information, in terms of bits. So for a highly entangled generic quantum state of many qubits, just a few hundred qubits, if I wanted to write down a complete classical description of all the ways the qubits are correlated with one another, I'd have to write down more bits than the number of atoms in the visible universe. So that in itself doesn't mean that by manipulating the quantum information, we'd be able to do useful things. But we do have some reasons for thinking that quantum computing will be powerful. For one thing, we know of some examples of problems that we think are hard for classical conventional computers but for which theoretically quantum computers would be able to solve uh, the problem efficiently. The 
best known example of that is finding the prime factors of a large composite integer. And we think factoring is hard because really smart people have been trying for decades to come up with more efficient factoring algorithms for classical computers and haven't succeeded. The theoretical computer scientists have come up with arguments uh, which under reasonable assumptions lead to the conclusion that we can do a quantum computation of modest size and then measure all the qubits to acquire a bit string and that in doing so we're sampling from a probability distribution of bit strings that we can't sample from efficiently by any classical means. But most tellingly, we just don't know how with a conventional computer to simulate with a, what a quantum computer does. And that's not for lack of trying. Physicists and chemists have been trying for decades to come up with better methods for simulating the behavior of large complex quantum systems. And still, in the hard instances, the best algorithms that we have require a computational cost which scales exponentially with the size of the system, with the number of qubits. Now, we shouldn't think that quantum computing has unlimited power. We don't expect, for example, to be able to efficiently find exact solutions to the worst-case instances of NP-hard optimization problems with the quantum computer. But it's still a remarkable observation about the difference between quantum and classical physics, that there are problems which we think are too hard to solve using conventional computers, but could be efficiently solved with quantum computers. I think that's one of the most interesting things we've ever said about the difference between quantum and classical. So there's a very strong incentive to understand better what are these problems that are classically hard and quantumly easy. And we have learned a lot of things about that over the last 25 years. I think we still have a great deal more to learn about it. And we will find out more about the answer to this question by experimenting with quantum machines. But if you're a physicist, there's a natural place to look for such problems. We expect that with a quantum computer, we'd be able to efficiently simulate any process that occurs in nature. And we don't think that's true for conventional computers, which can't efficiently simulate very highly entangled matter. So with quantum computers, we'd expect to be able to probe more deeply into the properties of complex molecules and exotic materials, and also probe fundamental physics in new ways, for example, by simulating very high collisions of fundamental particles, or the quantum behavior of a black hole, or the behavior of the early universe right after the Big Bang. It's not a new idea that if we could develop quantum computers, we could use them for this type of application. Uh, but quantum computers are just now getting to the point where they're capable of doing things that are informative for a quantum scientist. So evidently, it's hard to make a quantum computer. And the essence of why it's difficult is that we want quantum computing hardware to simultaneously satisfy some criteria which are nearly incompatible with one another. We want qubits to interact strongly with one another so we can efficiently process the information they encode, but we don't want qubits to interact with the outside world, which would cause the uh, quantum magic to fail and a quantum computer to crash. But we do want to control a quantum computer from the outside and ultimately read out a classical result, the solution to a problem. So why is it so important that the quantum computer not interact with the outside world. That's because of the phenomenon we call decoherence. A fundamental difference between quantum and classical information is that you can't observe a quantum state without disturbing it in some uncontrollable way. So if we want to perform a quantum computation reliably, we need to keep the information that's being processed nearly perfectly isolated from the outside world. And that's hard to do because our hardware is always going to be imperfect. But we've understood in principle how to make quantum computing robust against decoherence and other potential sources of noise using the idea we call quantum error correction. And the essence of the idea is that if we want to protect quantum information from damage, then we should encode it in a very non-local way, encode it in a highly entangled state so that when the environment interacts with the parts of the system one by one, it doesn't acquire 
encoded information, just like that 100-page book where we couldn't learn the content of the book by reading one page at a time. So that way we can protect information in a quantum memory, and we've also learned how to efficiently process information that's encoded in that highly entangled way. So where's the technology now? There are a number of different approaches to building quantum hardware that are steadily advancing. Qubits can be instantiated in a variety of different ways. For example, a qubit could be encoded in the spin or magnetic field of a single electron or the polarization state or phase of a single photon or the internal state of a single atom. But these are all rather remarkable encodings because the information is carried by a very simple single quantum system. But through several decades of technical advances, we've learned how to control these systems pretty well. Or the information could be encoded in a more complex system like an electrical circuit that conducts electricity without resistance at very low temperature. And that's also a remarkable encoding because the qubit is now encoded in the collective motion of billions of pairs of electrons, but we've learned to manipulate that qubit as though it were a single atom. Oh, it's useful to have a word for the era of quantum information processing that we have now entered. The word NISC has caught on. It's an acronym, which means noisy intermediate scale quantum. Intermedi intermediate scale meaning that we now have systems with, say, more than 50 qubits, where it's very difficult to simulate by brute force on our most powerful existing supercomputers what the quantum device is doing. But noisy reminds us that these devices are not error corrected, and the noise is a serious limitation on their computational power, on the depth of the computations that they can perform reliably. For physicists, NISC is exciting. It's giving us tools for exploring experimentally the properties of highly entangled matter that we've never had access to before, opening opportunities for discovery. And it may have applications of broader interest, but we're not really sure about that. We shouldn't think of NISC as something that's going to change the world by itself. It's a step towards the more powerful quantum technologies we hope to develop in the future. We'll probably will need to make use of quantum error correction. I do feel confident that quantum computing will eventually have transformative impact on society. But that could still be a ways off, and we don't really know how long it's going to take to get there. Looking ahead, we can envision applications of quantum computing, say, to studies of chemistry and materials, and perhaps also optimization, where if we had an ideal quantum computer, rather optimistically, we could say that we could run applications that would surpass what we can do with our most powerful conventional computers uh, with just a few hundred qubits. But the catch is that we don't have noiseless quantum computers, though ones we have today with multi-qubit devices, the probability of making an error every time you perform a gate on a pair of qubits is around 1%. We can foresee improving that, say, to an error rate of a tenth of a percent, fairly soon, but even so, to run these applications that we feel confident will surpass what conventional computers can do, uh, we would have to make use of quantum error correction and have a lot of overhead due to the redundancy required for quantum error correction to work. So there might be thousands of physical qubits for each one of the protected logical qubits, and bringing the total count of physical qubits into the millions. And that's a pretty big leap from where we're likely to be in the next few years with devices which have hundreds of physical qubits. So there are really two big open questions confronting quantum computing today. How are we going to scale up to larger quantum computers that really can solve very hard problems? And once we have that capability, what will, what will be the most effective ways of applying it to problems in science and in industry? And I consider both questions to be wide open. Uh, we have a lot to learn before we'll have definitive answers to either question, in my opinion. Nevertheless, I think the next few years are going to be exciting. 
we expect to see encouraging progress towards the realization of quantum error correction from which we can continue to scale upward. And we can anticipate that there will be scientific discoveries resulting from the quantum simulators and quantum computers that we currently have if we use them to explore the uh, properties of highly entangled matter in ways that we never could before. All right, so what does this have to do with AI? Well, the dilemma we face is we live in a quantum world, but we're classical beings. And sometimes our classical nature can impede our ability to interact with, learn from, and understand the underlying quantum reality. I want to talk about two ways in which we can enhance our understanding of the quantum world, which I'll call learning with classical machines and learning with quantum machines. It's possible to convert a complex many qubit state to a succinct classical description of the state. But in doing so, we necessarily discard a vast amount of information. But nevertheless, we can retain a lot of physically relevant information about the state. And then we can apply classical machine learning tools to generalize from that data to make predictions about quantum systems that we haven't encountered in the lab up until now. And we can use those classical machine learning tools to learn to recognize when new quantum phases of matter have been created that we haven't seen in the lab before. With quantum machines, we can go further. If we can collect quantum data in the field and transduce it to a quantum memory and then process it with a quantum computer, then for some task, we can show that that provides an exponential advantage in making predictions. That is the number of experiments that we need to do to make accurate predictions can be exponentially fewer if we make use of quantum processing instead of classical machine learning. The barrier we face in trying to understand better the quantum world is a curse of dimensionality. An n-qubit Hilbert space live, sorry, an n-qubit system lives in a Hilbert space which is of dimension exponential in n. In poss it's possible in principle to write down a complete description of the state, but it's not at all practical to do so because it requires an exponential number of bits. To acquire that description would require an exponential in n number of experiments. To use that description to predict properties of the state would require an exponential amount of processing time. But we can take the point of view that we don't really need a complete description. We may be satisfied to be able to predict many properties of the quantum state or system in question. And for the last couple of years, we've been developing an idea, especially with my fantastic collaborators, Robert Wong and Richard Kuhn, an idea we call classical shadows of quantum states. The classical shadow protocol is a way of, by doing a relatively small number of experiments that are feasible with the hardware that we have now to acquire a succinct classical description of the state from which we can predict many properties. And furthermore, we can have rigorous guarantees that our predictions are accurate. So here's an example of a technical result which goes in that direction. So let's suppose that we have the ability to acquire multiple identically prepared copies of some n qubit quantum state when n is relatively large. We might prepare it using a quantum computer or a quantum simulator or some other protocol that we carry out in the laboratory. And what we would like to be able to do is to predict many properties of the state. Let's say we would like to be able to predict accurately the expectation values of many observables. The observables are operators acting on the Hilbert space. And let's suppose that the observables that I'm interested in uh, act on no more than W out of the n qubits. Uh, typically, I'll be interested in the case where W is a constant independent of n. So then we carry out the following procedure. For each one of those identical copies, we do a very simple measurement. For each one of the n qubits in that copy, we perform a measurement of that qubit in a random basis. 
That is, we do an orthogonal projection in the two-dimensional Hilbert space of that qubit and acquire one bit of information from each qubit. And so when we measured all n qubits one by one, we acquire an uh, n-bit string. And then after we repeat that uh, multiple times, we have a collection of snapshots of the state, and that collection of snapshots is what we call the classical shadow. So there are two sources of randomness in this procedure. There's the randomness of our choice of measurement for each one of the qubits, and there's also the intrinsic measure, uh, randomness of the quantum measurement process. But what we can show is that using those snapshots, using that classical shadow, we can efficiently estimate the expectation value of observables by efficient classical processing. And furthermore, we can get an upper bound on the variance of our estimator, which is an unbiased estimator for that property. And we can show that large deviations from mean values are exponentially rare. So that means we can use that same classical data to estimate a number of properties which is exponential in the number of copies of the state that we had access to in the lab. In a recent review, we distilled this randomized measurement method to an aphorism, measure first, ask questions later. You don't need to know what the properties are that you're going to want to predict at the time that the measurements are made. And in fact, many of the applications of classical shadows that have been carried out recently have been done by reanalyzing data that was taken in a quantum experiment with a different purpose initially in mind. So we've done uh, a lot of numerical experiments and applications of quantum data to see that the classical shadow method is more efficient than some of the previously used methods for making predictions about quantum systems. Here's an example from an experiment done a few years ago by a group in Innsbruck, which uh, were using a 20 a qubit ion trap quantum computer. They were trying by a variational method to find properties of low energy states in uh, a certain system. It's a model of electrodynamics in one spatial dimension. And the Hamiltonian, the energy function of that system, is a sum of many terms, a number of terms which is of order n squared when n is the number of qubits. And not only did they estimate the energy, they also estimated the variance of the energy because the signal that they had found in energy eigenstate was that the variance of the energy was zero. So that meant they had to estimate the square of the Hamiltonian which had of order n to the fourth terms. It's a lot of terms when n is equal to 20. And they developed a customized procedure for learning all of those quantities with a number of samples of the state, which grows linearly with the total number of qubits. But in the case of classical shadows, the number of copies that we meet, need just grows logarithmically with the system size, with the number of qubits. It's a big advantage when n is large. And in fact, we can de-randomize the classical shadow protocol to get an even more efficient procedure. All right, now that we've seen that it's possible to take a complex quantum system, translate it to a succinct classical description, and use that classical description to predict many properties of the state, one wonders about whether we can solve quantum problems using classical processing and taking the classical shadows as inputs. Not surprisingly, there's been a lot of interest in the last few years in using machine learning to solve quantum problems. Most of that work has been heuristic and empirical, but we were interested in whether we could, in some cases, give a rigorous guarantee that the ML methods give accurate predictions. And we succeeded in doing that in a couple of cases. So one such setting is predicting properties of ground states of quantum systems. So let's imagine there's some family of Hamiltonians, of energy operators, which are smoothly parametrized by some set of real parameters. And during training, we're given samples of ground states of randomly selected Hamiltonians 
in this family. And then our task after training is to predict properties of ground states in the family which are different from the ones we encountered during training. So our idea is that each time you get access to one of these ground state samples, you immediately do an experimentally feasible measurement to obtain its classical shadow. And then we try to generalize from the classical shadows to find a classical representation of the ground states for other Hamiltonians in the family. And we showed that if the Hamiltonians are gapped, that is, if the energy splitting between the ground state and the first excited state is greater than some non-zero constant throughout the parameter regime, then this learning procedure is efficient, that we can make accurate predictions about ground state properties with an amount of training data and an amount of computation time, which is just linear in the system size and polynomial in the dimension of the parameter space. So the learning is entirely classical but we would make use of the quantum platform to prepare and acquire the classical shadow for the ground states in the training set. And in fact, we can show under complexity theory assumptions that access to data is very empowering, that we can make predictions about ground state properties when we have access to training data, which would be too hard to obtain if we didn't have access to data at all. So we've done a number of numerical experiments and there have been applications to physical experiments to uh, test how well this method works. So here's one example of a numerical experiment that we did. It's based on an experiment done a few years ago with a chain of 53 qubits. Uh, qubits in this case were encoded in uh, each one in a single atom. And the Hamiltonian, the energy function has uh, two properties. It favors that each one of the qubits point in a preferred direction in its Hilbert space, but it also penalizes two qubits that are both pointing in the same direction when they're in close uh, geometric proximity to one another. And so there's a competition between these two effects, and as a result, there's a um, non-trivial phase diagram. There are different phases where the ground state has different um, types of order for different values of the parameters. So what we did is we sampled some points in this parameter space. Those are the ones shown by the gray circles. Uh, we simulated acquiring classical shadows at those points. We used our ML algorithm to then make predictions about other points, like the uh, triangle, the star, and the cross. And we can predict any local property that we want, but let's say we're trying to predict the probability that each one of the 53 qubits uh, points in some particular direction in the Hilbert space. So in this uh, plot, the, the essentially exact results are the uh, pink curve and the diamonds are the predictions of the ML model and they, they match up quite well. In fact, in this case, our rigorous theorem doesn't guarantee that we'd have a good prediction performance because we're sampling from three different phases of matter. The theorem applies if both our test set and our training set come from the same gap phase of matter, uh, but still uh, the prediction performance was quite good. If we had tried to make predictions just from the closest by points in the parameter space in this family of Hamiltonians, uh, then the prediction performance is not very good. So the ML algorithm really is leveraging the ability to sample from a variety of different ground states in the family. Another setting we considered is learning to classify quantum phases of matter. So you learned in high school that matter can be a gas or a liquid or a solid. In fact, physicists know of hundreds of different phases of matter, including quantum phases at zero temperature which are distinguished according to the structure of the many-body quantum entanglement in the ground state of the system. So we considered a supervised learning scenario. Suppose there are two different quantum phases, and during training, we are offered uh, labeled samples from the two phases, each one saying whether it's in phase A or phase B, 
And then after training, we're given un unlabeled samples and we're supposed to uh, classify whether they're in phase A or phase B. So our, our idea is to take each one of those samples and convert it to its classical shadow and then use classical ML to learn to classify the classical shadows. And we showed that that could be done efficiently under a physically motivated assumption that the amount of training data that we need and the computation time to correctly identify the phase scale polynomially in the system size. Now, the learning strategy is a standard one. We define a feature map that maps the classical shadows to a high dimensional feature space. And then we learn a classifying function in the feature space. Of course, the learning algorithm doesn't know what that function is in advance. It learns the classifying function, and that can provide guidance to the physicists for trying to understand how the structure of the entanglement in the two phases uh, differ from one another. So here, too, we've done a number of numerical experiments. So here's one of them. Uh, this is for a system of 100 qubits on a square lattice, a 10 by 10 lattice. And uh, we have two different uh, phases that we're sampling from, uh, which differ according to whether they have only short-range quantum entanglement or long-range quantum entanglement. In the latter case, we call it a topological phase. And a computer science way of distinguishing the two phases is saying this, that if you're given the, uh, a sample of the phase with short-range entanglement and you want to apply a geometrically local quantum computation to that state to produce a sample in the phase with long-range entanglement, then the depth of that circuit has to grow with the system size. So what we did here is we picked samples from the short-range entangled phase and the long-range entangled phase, and we applied low-depth circuits to both samples, which made them harder to recognize. And uh, then we uh, made use of our feature map and then did a principal component analysis in the feature space. So we were doing unsupervised learning in this case. But uh, in, this, in the a picture on the left, uh, we applied depth three circuits to the short range entangled and long range entangled uh, samples on our uh, 10 by 10 lattice. And it was easy to distinguish uh, the two phases, even in this unsupervised learning scenario. OK, so the last thing I want to describe is how if we do quantum processing, we can perform tasks that wouldn't be possible uh, without quantum processing. So again, I want to consider a scenario where we have access to multiple copies identically prepared of a many qubit quantum state. And our task is to predict properties of that state. But I want to distinguish two scenarios. The first is the one we've considered up till now, that for each one of those copies, we perform some measurement on the copy. It can be any measurement uh, that we please. And in fact, it could be adaptive. So the measurement we perform on each copy could depend on the outcomes we obtain for measurements that we performed in earlier rounds. And then we use all that classical data to try to predict some property of interest. In the quantum enhanced scenario, we capture multiple copies of the state, deposit them in a quantum memory, and do a quantum computation collectively on the copies, across the copies. And what we can prove is that for some tasks, Using the quantum enhanced method, we can achieve an exponential advantage. Exponentially fewer experiments suffice to make accurate predictions. And in fact, the quantum processing that we need to do to realize this exponential advantage is extremely simple, simple enough that we can do a proof of principle demonstration on existing quantum hardware. And in fact, we did experiments using the Google Sycamore quantum computer using up to 40 qubits on that device uh, to see how well it works. So here's um, a result from one of those experiments. So, uh, so the scenario is that we're given multiple copies of the device. And then after training, we are presented with uh, two observables, which are drawn from an exponentially long list. 
and we're supposed to predict which one of the two has a larger expectation value. And so we can prove that for a particular uh, prepared quantum state, which is actually simple to prepare, so we can really do it in our demonstration experiment, that the number of copies that we need in the conventional scenario is exponential in the system size. In the quantum enhanced scenario, we store two copies on our quantum uh, computer, and then we do entangling measurements across the two copies, which are simple to do because we just need to do measurements in an entangled basis on pairs of qubits. And then we use the data collected from those measurements to try to make our prediction. So what's shown in the plot here is on the lower left is and we have on the horizontal axis the system size, the number of qubits, which for us was a maximum of 20 because we wanted to store two copies of our quantum state on a 40 qubit device. And on the vertical axis is the number of experiments needed to get a prediction accuracy of 70%. Now, ideally, if we had a perfect quantum computer, the number of experiments we would need to make good predictions in the quantum enhanced scenario would be completely independent of the system size. In fact, the number of experiments needed rises slowly as the system size increases because of the noise in the device. But for the largest system size that we were able to reach, which was a 20 qubits, the number of experiments that sufficed to make an accurate prediction in the quantum enhanced scenario was below a rigorous lower bound on how many would be needed in the conventional scenario by over three orders of magnitude. One can also consider trying to learn properties of processes instead of states. So we did experiments on Sycamore of that type as well so in this case, we considered randomly selected quantum circuits applied to some fixed input state. And these, those circuits were drawn from one of two possible symmetry classes. And one can prove that if you do the conventional experiments where you measure the output from the process one copy at a time, that a number of experiments, which is exponential in the system size, it needed to distinguish the two classes um, whereas with the quantum enhanced uh, method, we can learn efficiently. So uh, what I'm showing here is we applied a, uh, an unsupervised ML model to the output from the conventional experiments and the quantum enhanced experiments. And for both a one-dimensional and two-dimensional uh, random circuit, we were easily able to distinguish the two symmetry classes in the quantum enhanced scenario and weren't able to distinguish them at all in the conventional scenario. Okay, so now I'll sum up. Broadly useful applications of quantum computing might still be a ways off. Quantum error correction probably will be needed to reach those applications. But already with existing quantum platforms, we have an opportunity to do unprecedented experiments that explore the features of highly entangled matter, and that's going to enable new discoveries in the near term. Classical shadows of quantum states are a feasible protocol for translating a many qubit quantum state to a succinct classical description of the state such that we can accurately predict with a guarantee of success a number of properties of the state which is exponential in the number of experiments that we've done. And furthermore, we don't need to know what the properties are that we wish to predict at the time the measurements are done. We can measure first and ask questions later. If we have access to data from quantum experiments and then we apply classical machine learning to that data, we can in some cases solve quantum problems that would just be too hard to solve without access to data. And if we do quantum enhanced experiments, which make use of quantum memory and quantum processing, that can, for some tasks, give us an exponential advantage in the number of experiments we need to do to predict reliably. So we can envision that as we acquire greater mastery of the quantum world, we'll become more adept at using data from measurements of quantum systems to generalize to new situations, which are different from the ones we've encountered in the lab before. And we can envision future quantum sensing networks 
that will capture quantum data, transduce it to quantum memory, process it with a quantum computer, and by that means, see signals that would otherwise be too deeply concealed uh, to be seen with more conventional sensing methods. At any rate, we hope that our results will stimulate some fresh thinking about how to seek advantage using quantum technology. Thanks for listening. Um, I, so obviously, I mean, this is all very exciting stuff, but it's also a little terrifying, right? So, you know, what happens the first time somebody actually does create a qubit computer that can break RSA, and then suddenly they don't tell anybody except that they use it to steal everybody's money? Well, um, there is probably that that's still a ways off. It could take 20 years before there are quantum computers that can break RSA. But there's urgency now in converting to encryption methods, which will be resistant to quantum attacks. And in fact, NIST has been conducting a public competition for several years, and they have tentatively identified a suite of algorithms that can replace the ones that we are using now, and for which they, uh, based on what's uh, attempts to break those algorithms, uh, they are believed to be robust against attacks by both classical and quantum computers, and also to be simple enough that they can be flexibly implemented. Um, and even if quantum computers aren't going to be capable of breaking existing encryption methods like RSA for uh, 20 years, um, it's important to get started because the migration process is very complex and is going to take a long time. And furthermore, there's concern about encrypted traffic now and in the near future being captured and then decrypted with future machines. So um, NIST is expected to finalize and publish new standards for public key cryptography next year. And they, the US government, and in fact, uh, governments around the world will be urging uh, people to migrate uh, as quickly as possible. But of course, we want to do that migration uh, correctly. And uh, it's important actually to wait until the standards are, are finalized before uh, before taking that step. All right, thank you. Hi, thanks for the really interesting talk. Um, I think one thing I'm interested in is it seems like these classical shadows are really powerful. Uh, and a lot of like relevant physical observables kind of fall in this category. I'm wondering if uh, outside of this, uh, I guess, like a constructed example, are there any interesting observables that uh, do have this like non-local property that you can't really access using classical shadows? Right, I described a classical shadow algorithm that is specifically designed for the purpose of computing local observables, which are the ones that physicists are often interested in. And uh, I focused on that in particular because it's something we can do now with the hardware that currently exists. There are also versions of the protocol which give access to some global quantities. And for that purpose, we need a way of sampling which has global properties as well so there are methods for doing uh, quantum circuits which have a depth that grows linearly with the system size and then measuring and then using those snapshots to generalize and for that purpose we uh, we can predict some non-local properties that's still too hard to do because our quantum computers are too noisy when when n is large uh, but eventually we'll be able to do that and an example of something we could predict is the fidelity of the state that was produced in the lab with some desired uh, target state. And in principle, we could uh, estimate that fidelity for um, 
you know, a number of target states, which is exponential in the number of times we, we run the uh, protocol and take a snapshot. Great, thanks. Okay, uh, thank you. Very good talk. Uh, I'm very interested in the result on this screen in the middle for the uh, number of that uh, log M number of copies efficient for uh, to predict M properties. Now the first question is, can this result be extended to general machine learning structure? Like if I have a neural network, we have this number of output, and what is the base like number of like how do you this like the, describe the data set requirement which is good enough sufficient to predict? Now the second question is regarding th this particular result, like when you said the number of the copies, what are those standards to differentiate, to define each copy? Right. Um, really what we need to get this result is uh, from a probability theory point of view, not so remarkable. We have to argue that we have some unbiased estimator for the quantities in of interest and that uh, we need to have some bound on the variance of that estimator and for the protocol I described uh, we can bound it by a constant independent of the system size and then we need a statement that large deviations you know away from the mean compared to the variance are exponentially rare and um, and then the claim follows now, for quantum physicists, it was still quite a surprise because the novel thing here is, is the quantum noise, the randomness of the quantum measurement process. And if you're trying to predict many observables in a quantum setting, typically those observables are not compatible with one another. They don't commute. So learning one observable very accurately doesn't necessarily give you any helpful information for learning another non-commuting observable. So the thing that surprised us when we obtained the result is that that non-commutativity uh, needn't be a barrier to efficiently learning. As far as the second uh, part of your, your question, the copies can be arbitrary, okay? Now, for the particular protocol that I described, we can't predict arbitrary properties, we can predict local properties. Anything that can be expressed in terms of an operator acting on some constant number of qubits can be predicted. But the quantum state, which is the input to the process, is unrestricted. It can be any state. It could be a very complex state in um, an n qubit Hilbert space. OK, thank you. Yeah, this is, uh, I think, very good thinking. And uh, I think, so it, based on my understanding, so this requirement can be extended in general mm -hmm. machine learning. Because in the general uh, literature, as far as I know, I do not see any kind of a theoretical result to quantify this, this process. A lot of researcher actually is try to do is the uh, try and error to see what is the best way. And there's no kind of theoretical foundation or guideline to set this up. Yeah, well, as we heard yesterday, you know, I'm a physicist, so I want to understand things. And so for our uh, lever for trying to get a better understanding was trying to see under what, uh, situations, we can make reliable predictions. I think that's on the path of uh, helping us to understand quantum systems better using AI. Thank you. Yeah.